What we do here is go back, 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 back. Hi, and welcome to Mr. Toyama's AP World History of Cerritos High School. This is chapter one of our AP World course, Before History. I'd like to start off by saying welcome to my course. Uh, this is the flipped classroom video, so you guys will be able to watch this whenever you want. Rewind it, pause it, make sure you take some good notes while we go through this. It should take a little over an hour to get through this. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at the PowerPoint provided by the Traditions and Encounters uh, book that we have for our course. It's a global perspective on the past, the fifth edition. Uh, the colored text edits by Mr. Toyama are in green, so those are things that probably won't show up on the traditional uh, AP PowerPoints that you would have from your course. So to begin, I'm going to give you these little intro for Mr. Toyama's AP World History class. So let's go ahead and start. To be able to successfully follow along with each lecture video or flip lecture, students will read the chapter two times, once before and after the lecture. Information in AP World History is complex and multiple readings will allow for the information to become more comprehensible. Uh, you will not succeed at passing either my course or the AP exam if you do not read your textbook. This is a college level textbook so you will need to make sure that you're reading this textbook thoroughly and you're taking good notes and you're listening to the lectures and participating in activities in class. Cornell notes will be required for each lecture. I will be checking these each day after the assigned lecture so make sure you take some copious amounts of notes to make sure that you're uh, getting all the information that you need. These notes will be due on the assigned date in class, usually the next day. At the end of each lecture, students will be required to prepare other work for the class that is assigned at the end of the video. So be on the lookout for some writing, some reading, some little uh, bullet point things you have to do at the end. Questions or concerns about the lecture should be sent via email, if urgent, or written on your Cornell notes for discussion in the next class today. We're going to usually have a class discussion the next day to make sure that everyone's on the same page for the lecture. Before each lecture, I'm going to give you the uh, chapter overview that's provided by our textbook, so I'll go ahead and read that now. Chapter 1, Before History. The first chapter deals with a number of large concepts that will help set the stage for the rest of world history. The rise of Homo sapiens, thinking man, and their migration from East Africa to the corners of the planet is the start of prehistory and subsequently history. The use of tools, like knives, spears, bow and arrows, and fire, by Homo sapiens marks the start of changes in the natural environment. Paleolithic, paleo meaning old and lithic meaning stone, societies were made up of hunter-gatherer peoples. Since they were constantly moving, they had few possessions, tended to live in small groups, 30 to 50 people, and lived a fairly egalitarian equal existence. In the Paleolithic era, we see the use of language increase dramatically, as well as the beginnings of art and animalistic religions. The Neolithic era, Neo meaning new and lithic meaning stone, marks the transition from hunter-gatherers to the agricultural societies. This first agricultural revolution, often referred to as the Neolithic Revolution, was the beginning of a time of major changes in human culture. The systemic cultivation of plants by women and the domestication of animals by men meant not only more food, but also a shift away from the egalitarianism between genders. The Neolithic Revolution was not a simple or singular event. Slash and burn agriculture led to the cultivation of new foods, but also contributed to the movement of peoples that had been part of hunter-gatherer societies. What the Neolithic Revolution did was to provide not only more food, but also a constant supply. This increased food supply allowed populations to grow, spurred on by the development of villages, developed a group of specialized laborers, since not everyone now had to be a farmer, and the Tigris-Euphrates Valley led to the rise of cities. So first up, we have the forming of complex society. Before we begin any uh, discussion about history, I want to make sure you understand some dates. In the green on the right-hand side, you see BCE and B and CE, which uh, will be denoting a change in how you maybe have understood history uh, marked in your textbooks. BCE stands for Before Common Era, and CE stands for Common Era. These years are basically the same as uh, noted with BC and AD, but these are more secular in the way that they're pronounced because before Common Era, yes, the years are still zero as being zero that we would understand it. And yes, we are still in the CE 2015 is right now. So you'll be able to um, hear that and learn about that a little more. But just kind of keep that in mind as we go through so you're not too confused. Uh, for forming a complex society, we have to have some basic development. There's hunting and foraging. Uh, people have to basically go around and their number one goal as being alive is finding food. 
and then water and then shelter as basic uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs that we understand. But what people really started off with when we started studying history is uh, hunting. They need to find some sort of uh, food to keep themselves going. So hunting became a very large part of their diet, meaning that they would go around and attack animals and basically use their meat for sources of protein. From there, they would do some foraging. Now, foraging means they would go around and look for uh, edible berries, edible roots, plants, some sort of uh, crops that we would think of today. They didn't look a lot like the crops that we have today, like an apple didn't look like the apples at the stores, but they were enough to get people by to keep them moving and keep them alive. Eventually, we get to the development of agriculture, which is basically farming. We have people building farms. We're not going to get there just yet, but just keep that in mind that people will eventually make farms because hunting and uh, foraging will only get you so far because it's unreliable. It's not really dependable that if we wandered around for a couple days, are we going to find small animals? Are we going to find anim uh, plants that we could harvest? Well, not necessarily. Whereas agriculture, if you set up a field and you plant a crop in a certain amount of time, you'd find that crop growing there and you could harvest it and eat it. Well, after agriculture, because the calorie counts go up and people are able to have more food, meaning that they're able to move up the hierarchy of needs that Maslow talked about, and make sure that we have this understanding that people are going to have more free time because they're not wandering around, well, they're going to eventually learn to do other activities, such as making babies. And this is going to lead to more people. And more people means that we're going to have more complex society because we're going to have a lot more people needing to do more jobs, which uh, is now being taken over or replaced the old system of hunting and foraging. Now, the key issue here is this surplus capital. And when I talk about capital, I'm not talking about money, or capitals of cities or countries, I'm talking about capital as in goods. So there was this extra amount of goods that people have to have to form a complex society. You can't have a very large community if you don't have enough food for your community. If you have 100 people in your community and you only have food for 50, well, 50 of them are going to die eventually. Whereas if you have 100 people in your community and you have enough food for 120 people, you actually have a surplus or extra amount of food to give to those people that are already alive so they could possibly make more people or find more people wandering around. The major development of the first complex societies start around 3500 BCE to about 500 BCE. Now when we talk about prehistory, we're kind of looking at history before people started writing stuff down. So we have to think about, number one, what is history? History for historians often revolves around one very large uh, contribution by human beings, which is documentation. Now you're going to ask, how did people who were basically banging rocks together write things down? Well, they didn't. So we're going to kind of skip ahead a little bit by archaeological discovery, the stuff that's left behind. Now all the people that we're talking about really didn't have written records as we'd understand them today. They didn't make books, they didn't have complex languages that they could share across time, but what they did have is some cave paintings we're going to look at, and also some tools and some uh, like goods that they left behind that we're able to look at and say, oh, these people were here. But when we do talk about documentation, eventually we're going to talk about primary and secondary sources. This is the cornerstone of all history. Primary sources are sources that were created by the people at the time. The U.S. Constitution, for example, is a primary source. It was created by the founders of the United States as a way to communicate what their country should run like. Now, it's a primary source because it was created by the people at that time, living during that time, uh, trying to communicate ideas for the long run. Whereas secondary sources would be, for example, our textbook talking about the U.S. Constitution. It has nothing to do with the people that actually made it, and actually the secondary source was made hundreds of years after, for example, the Constitution of the United States. Yet these secondary sources can provide context, it can provide some other outside sources that help us to understand the documents, and it also can give us some uh, connecting ideas that maybe shaped or influenced the people that were writing that stuff that weren't available in the original documents. Now, there is a requisite human presence or natural history that we're going to be studying in this chapter specifically called natural history, basically the history of people leaving stuff behind. Now, leaving stuff behind isn't that they left it there on purpose, but more that this is just incidentals. For example, there are campsites in the middle of the deserts of Israel uh, slash Palestine that are hundreds if not thousands of years old. We only know they've been there because people had built small fires, the evidence of the um, 
small scrapings or bones that we find, we can carbon date them and we can figure out, oh, people were here hundreds of years ago, not last night. And if you think about it, uh, if you go throughout your day and you didn't have a, a nice disposal system like we have, like garbage cans and waste management, you would probably leave a lot of just stuff lying around, bones and, and trash and maybe some discarded garments that, you know, you tore your pants or something, and you'd leave that wherever it is. And if, if given enough time, eventually that would just become part of the land, and when people started digging around, they would find, hey, here's those bones that people ate a long time ago. So as we study history, we're going to look at some of those different uh, types of history uh, sources that give us information on the past. First up, we have the development of hominids. They're originally from East Africa. Uh, originally, we know that people evolved. Whether or not you'd like to understand that with whatever religious context you want to have, that's fine. But what I want to talk about mostly is that animals uh, are basically the starting point for all of human existence. The way that we understand DNA, the way that we understand humans and animals, like apes specifically, are very closely linked. And the way that we understand how people evolved is through natural selection. Now natural selection is animals adapting themselves to their environment. If you think about uh, if you're cold, for example, or you're wandering around in the middle of the desert, as another example, you're going to make some choices on what you're wearing, how you decide to interact in that environment, and those choices are animals, i.e. you, adapting yourself to your environment. When it's cold outside, you put on extra layers. When it's hot outside, you take some off and you drink some more water. Either way, we know that animals are choosing to make decisions to help uh, protect themselves against their environment that they have no control over. For example, cold-blooded animals will uh, hide in the shade when it's hot and sit in the sun when it's kind of cold, and you get that whole idea. Hominids, however, adapted the environment to themselves. Hominids are the first animals that we have that we can record that actually chose to make decisions outside of just uh, picking and choosing where to be. For example, snakes will lay on rocks to warm up, but humans will move to the shade or build shelters to protect themselves from the sun. Through the use of tools, humans were, or hominids specifically, were able to make choices that uh, allowed them to survive better. This use of tools led them to find better sources of food, it allowed them to kill animals, which led to food. It allowed them to uh, build weapons to protect themselves from other animals, etc., etc. We also know that hominids developed language. Now, this language wasn't very complex. It was basically a series of grunts, like, mm, right? And when you think about, mm, and all the things you can do with those grunting sounds, you can communicate a little bit things like anger, like, mm, or you can communicate things like happiness, like, mm, and those basic sounds can give at least communication to another animal or to another hominid that you're either enjoying something or you're not enjoying something. Uh, hominids also developed complex cooperative social structures. They were able to work together. Animals in the animal kingdom sometimes work together, but hominids were really good at making sure that they chose to work with one another to survive better. Humans before history. We know that hominids are the early ancestors to what we would now call human beings. Now we know that the first humans to ever come out of wherever they came from, basically through evolution, started in Tanzania, Tanzania Ethiopia, and Kenya. These humans did not look a lot like human beings we know today, they were hominids. And we have found tools dating back to about five million years ago. Now we wouldn't really call these very complex tools. They were basically just really sharp rocks or really rounded stones. And remember, these aren't humans, but they are ancestors to humans. And the species of uh, these people that we found are related to what is known as Australopithecus. This happened sometimes between four million years ago and a million years before what we would call Lucy. And I'm going to show you a picture of Lucy in a little bit. Now the Australopithecus literally translates to the southern ape, and despite its name, it's a hominid, meaning an early ancestor of humans. There was a discovery of a skeleton named AL-288-1 north of a city called Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. The people who found this um, 
skeleton structure basically nicknamed it Lucy because it was a woman and she stood about three foot five when she was alive she was 55 pounds she was bipedal which meant that she walked on two feet she had a brain of about 500 uh, cc's whereas the modern human has uh, 1400 cc or cubic centimeter brain now you can tell right away that there's a lot of differences between what we would understand as humans today and hominids or Australopithecus back then. Australopithecuses were obviously much smaller and much lighter. This comes from the fact that they were oftentimes hunter-gatherers looking around for food. And when you're looking around for food, you're burning a lot of calories. If you imagine uh, how many calories it probably takes to walk miles and miles and miles to find food, you're going to burn a lot of calories, especially if you have everything you own strapped to your back and you have other groups of people around you and maybe you have to climb and traverse over land and things like that. Well, you're going to have a calorie deficiency. And we know now through science that some of the er the most important things you can have in early development is uh, calorie intake and nutrition. Getting the right amount of vitamins, minerals, and calories at a very young age will help you to grow very tall, help you to be the right weight. Well, Lucy was only three foot five, and she was also 55 pounds because of those reasons. She was bipedal, which means that she, this is the first time we notice that animals are walking upright, especially from that specific uh, species slash uh, genus. And we know that the bipedalness actually helps because now instead of walking on all fours like a dog or like a cat, the front um, paws, or what we would call hands today, are now free to use tools to manipulate the environment around them and basically start the process of becoming more human. Their brain being smaller meant that they had limited speech and they also had lower centers of um, judgment and other sorts of things that we associate with a very large brain as a modern human has. But these limited speech patterns actually helped them in the long run because they didn't really need complex speech when you're just wandering around looking for food. They did have one significant advantage over other animals of the time. They had an opposable digit, the finger slash thumb. If you think about how your fingers work and how they wiggle, they can actually bend, they can grab, they can grasp. If you try and hand your cat a fork, it's not going to use it very properly, number one, because it's a cat, and number two, because it can't hold a fork. So it's not gonna be able to work very well. Whereas human beings, most of us, can hold a fork correctly and use it to shovel food into our fat faces. Uh, we also know that Australopithecus deliberately took trips about 9.3 miles for stones, obsidian stones. These are very sharp stones that you can sharpen into uh, weapons or tools for like spears, for example. And this uh, idea of deliberately taking trips to look for an item shows a very uh, big jump in complex understanding of going and finding foods. Animals, most of the time, if you ever reserved animals that you maybe own, like dogs or cats, it knows that food is in its bowl when you put food in its bowl. But if you left your cat in your house and just locked it up for a while and never fed it, your cat's probably going to die because it doesn't really know to go and look for food necessarily. More wild animals will know to look for food, but uh, this is a big change because the Australopithecuses were not necessarily just looking for food. They were looking for stones and those stones would eventually lead them to food so that complex understanding of a then b of actions is very important to the growth of what we would now call humans here's a small picture of australopithecus uh, there's lucy she's in the box right there in red you can see she is very very small compared to homo erectus which isn't even uh, us we are homo sapiens so uh, you can see how in the picture before lucy the uh, animal that closely resembles an ape still has at its feet kind of an almost looking like a hand for a foot but lucy is starting to look bipedal and actually not using her foot for grabbing and grasping like monkeys do and more like uh, what we would understand as human beings today later hominids homo erectus the upright walking human uh, they developed around two million to two hundred thousand years ago. They had a larger brain capacity, about a thousand cubic centimeters. They had improved tool use, which means they built axes. And when you think about why you build an axe, you use it to chop down wood. And when you chop down wood, you're obviously using that wood for fire or for structures. But uh, for example, we know that the Homo erectus was able to control fire. They were able to figure out how to start fires and use that fire to either keep themselves warm or to cook their food, which increases calorie um, intake because it makes food taste better. 
Uh, we know that Homo erectus also had the ability to communicate complex ideas. They had camps, and we knew that those camps were used for the distribution of food, meaning they were able to band together, support one another, and protect one another from either uh, other groups of Homo erectus, or they were able to protect themselves from the environment, such as animals wandering around or predators. From there, we get to Homo sapiens, the consciously thinking human. They have the largest brain, especially in the frontal regions. The frontal regions are your vocal centers and also your decision centers. Uh, their most sophisticated tools and social organization uh, come from this time. They have a very flexible language. They're the ones who are going to start using words and making hundreds of different sounds with the tongue and the vocal cords. Now we're going to look at the migration of Homo erectus and Homo sapiens. There's a picture of Homo erectus. You can see the difference between Lucy. Now here's a map of the world showing the global migrations of Homo erectus and Homo sapiens. First off, people came from this area of East Africa, like right where the box just dropped. People then started to move as Homo erectus and Homo sapiens up north through northern Africa into parts of uh, the Middle East we would call today. About mm, two million years ago, the Homo erectus kept going and developed uh, into Asia, eventually crossing this green area that was a large frozen glacier known as the ancient land bridge that led them to get to North America and eventually to South America. Um, there was a small group that we know of that broke off from the Asian group originally and led to Australia. These again were frozen land bridges they were able to walk across or the use of um, just basically traversing land that had fallen away or has fallen away since then and eventually making it to small islands. You can see there's Australopithecus, that's the original, that's where the extent of their world would go, whereas Homo erectus and Homo sapiens would travel, basically spanning the entire globe. Now the natural environment. By 13,000 BCE, Homo sapiens are in every inhabitable part of the world. They have larger frontal brains, they're able to communicate more, they're able to develop uh, ways to protect themselves from the cold, especially in the northern regions. If you think about how the United States is set up, the coldest areas are not in the south, the coldest areas are in the north, closest to Canada, right? And that's where many of these um, groups were going. If you think about where Africa is, North Africa especially, Asia, uh, Russia, as some of those uh, early Homo sapiens walked through, we know that they were able to interact with their environment in a way that protected them. Through archaeological finds, we found some things like sophisticated tools. We found choppers, we found scrapers, we found axes, knives, and eventually bows and arrows which is very interesting development of making tools that can fire a uh, projectile very fast for killing animals or even other homo sapiens. They developed in cave and hut-like dwellings, so they would find a small cave, protect them from the elements, whether the rain or the sun, and they had hut-like dwellings which were more pop-up and they were able to develop um, basically things that would protect them from the elements. They were able to use fire and even animal skins to protect themselves from their environment. These homo sapiens a more complex language, they're going to start making sounds like l instead of m or g. And obviously, I'm butchering whatever language I'm attempting to speak, but you can understand that l and g are very different sounds than just m, you know. Hunted several mammal species to extinction. Uh, through their traversing across the globe, Homo sapiens basically hunted everything they could to keep that calorie count high. You need a very high calorie count, especially if you're migrating, and in cold uh, climates, you need to make sure that you eat a lot because your body is using a lot more energy to keep itself alive and warm. There was climactic change. Uh, this climate change basically has accelerated the process of animals dying off. We know that animals have died off since even before people showed up. That's just part of natural selection. Those who can't survive die. and when you're walking around hunting animals that are in really cold temperatures and it's some of the last animals from that species that are still alive and you're eating them well no more whatever that animal was here are some pictures of prehistoric stone tools from over 10,000 years ago these were found in a cave in France I'm not going to try and pronounce it because it's in French now we go to the Paleolithic era or the old stone age we have evidence that this is different uh, compared to the previous times because we know that through archaeological finds we were able to extrapolate from modern hunter-gatherer societies that the way that these people were living is very different than the way that the Australopithecus uh, animal was living. We know that this complex uh, modern hunter understanding 
developed because we are able to see that gender uh, lines developed a division. Women were gatherers and men were hunters. Now this doesn't have anything to do with sexism, it has more to do with body mass. Traditionally, in most circumstances with uh, what we would call the Australopithecus, the Homo sapiens, the Homo erectus, females of that species are, ten are tending to be smaller, whereas the males of that species tend to be larger with larger muscle mass. Now when you think about who do you want going around hunting, you're going to want the people with the more muscle mass who can hunt longer, hunt farther, who can wrestle like, I don't know, a bear to the ground or something, probably not a bear, but you know. And you want those people who are going out and hunting to have the strength to throw spears, to fire bows and arrows very accurately and very um, hard into an animal's body so when it's killed, and also to be able to have the body mass to drag whatever animal back to the campsite. Uh, this nomadic existence or traveling around kind of rotating based on whatever reason, usually the seasons, uh, precludes advanced civilization. You can't have an advanced civilization such as temples and cities and dwellings if you're always on the move, if you're following the herds that you're trying to eat. Now if you're a hunter-gatherer society and you pick all the berries in one area, you have to either wait for all the berries to grow back, which isn't a guarantee, or you go to the next area and find more berries. Same thing with herds of animals. If you hunt all the animals in one area, you have to move to another area to find more of the animals you would like to eat. Uh, this division among uh, gender lines for labor, I already discussed, is kind of just a natural predisposition for the Paleolithic era. During this time, however, there was relative social equality. The nomadic culture precludes the accumulation of land-based wealth. You can't have any sense of wealth or social status based on land, which is the earliest forms of money and wealth, without having a set place where you exist. How do you know which land is your land and which land is another person's land if you guys are always traveling looking for herds of animals? So this nomadic culture uh, couldn't base its wealth on uh, land as we would understand it in later times in our history studies. They lived a relatively egalitarian existence. Men and women were seen as relatively equal in value to the community. Women hunt, uh, gathered, excuse me, and men hunted. And that obviously led to people seeing value. If you like berries and you like meat, you're gonna see that both of those genders are valuable because you're not dead and you're eating berries and meat. Uh, there were more likely determinants of status, such as age. The older you were, the wiser you are, for example. If you had a stronger sense of hunting skills, the best hunters, the strongest hunters, those were better. Fertility. If you were able to bear many sons who bear many sons, you were probably going to be seen as a very uh, socially important person. And also personality. Even back then, there was some personality. People were well liked. I don't know if there were cliques or anything, but you can imagine that people had leaders they kind of rallied around. This possible gender equality related to food production. You could hunt for a very long time and not get a lot of meat. You could kill one deer, for example, and that would feed a large chunk of your tribe, but you're not going to get a ton of meat per person. This is balanced, however, if you're a woman and you have a group of women that go out and scavenge or gather for berries and roots and nuts and those sorts of things, and you're going to have a very large amount of those things because once you find like a berry bush, for example, you could pick the whole berry bush and you'd have a whole basket of berries. Now, when you think about your plate at dinner, what are you probably going to have more of if you were a hunter-gatherer society? Are you going to have more of protein, such as meat, or are you going to have more of the berries and the nuts? Well, obviously, you're going to have berries and nuts because the guarantee comes from wandering around looking for berries and nuts, not so much looking for the meat. Uh, men provided protein from hunting, which is a very important part of development for humans, and women did the plant gathering. Here are some pictures of modern-day hunter-gatherer societies that we've been able to understand how people maybe lived back then. You can see the women are scavenging through the um, bushes. And as a side note, you can see that small baby strapped to her back. This is a perfect um, job for women back during those times because women were able to take care of children, either making them walk with them or carrying them on their backs, keeping them relatively safe from danger compared to the men who were oftentimes hunting very dangerous animals and trying to kill and wound them. Next, we develop big game hunting as a species. There's evidence of intelligent coordination of hunting expeditions. Basically, people are able to rally people around them. Instead of one person going out and hunting by themselves, 
you're able to get groups of men to go out and hunt for uh, animals and meat. They develop weaponry such as um, spears and bows and arrows and spear throwers which were able to even throw spears up to speeds of 100 miles per hour and when you think about this development of weaponry you're able to do a lot of damage from a very far distance especially with bows and arrows and those spear throwers to animals without having to sneak up on them and if you've essentially been able to find an animal and surround it you have a really good chance if many people are firing spears at the same time versus one guy who gets one spear to throw they developed animal skin disguises and if you think about it today, there are hunters in the woods that wear, like, for example, like camouflage or put leaves all over themselves so the deers don't see them. Well, back then, they would just dress up as, like, deer skin, for example. We'll show a picture in a minute of being able to sneak up on deer and fire bows and arrows at them. They also use stampeding tactics. This is one of my favorite uh, things about big game hunting. They could light fires. And basically, if you were smart enough, you would go from one side of a field, you'd light a fire, and the animals would see the fire, smell the smoke, and they'd run the other direction, and you would already station some of your fellow hunters over there to throw spears or to, to chuck things at them, rocks or whatever, and try and kill those animals so that you can eat them for their meat. Sometimes even, if there was a cliff nearby, you'd drive them off the cliff, and they'd all fall down the cliff, and they'd all die. So that's kind of smart, uh, albeit cruel. <laughs> This required planning and communication. You had to understand the migration patterns of, say, birds, for example, or um, deer. Deer don't always stay in the same place. They migrate based on where their food is going as well. And when you understand how deer move, you can follow the deer around and kill them and eat them. Here's a picture of some deer at this nice little river getting some water. But if you look a little bit closer, you can see that some of those deer aren't actually deer, but hunters with bows hidden under them. And I mean, obviously this is just a drawing, but you get the idea. Next, we have Paleolithic settlements. Here are three societies we're going to kind of look at and kind of see how this fits into what we're talking about. Natufian society uh, filled up what we would call modern Israel and Jordan. Uh, they were cultivating wild wheat and herding very early on during the Paleolithic settlements or settlement times. Uh, the Joman society, which is around Japan... They're growing wild buckwheat, and they're fishing already off the coast. The Chinook Society, which is in the Pacific Northwest, they're eating berries, acorns, and they're also watching the salmon run. Salmon run upstream when they're going back to their original place where they were born. And if you're really smart, you can kind of just whack one out of the air or grab one while it's swimming upstream. There were groups of about a 1,000 or more. And if you think about that, that's a very big jump from where we had originally these small tribes or bands of hunter-gatherers and when you have something as predictable as, say, fish, you can always get fish from the ocean because there's always going to be fish in the ocean, or you go and you find salmon runs, and the salmon always run the same time of the year. When you understand those things about nature, even at a very basic level, you can start to develop a very large calorie surplus. And when you're developing a calorie surplus, you're able to have large groups of people join you or be born into your group because of that calorie uh, uptick. Next, we're going to look at the Neanderthal peoples. They lived in the Neander Valley, somewhere around western Germany. You can see in the map there. They flourished in Europe and southwest Asia 200,000 to 35,000 years ago. They also were found in Africa and East Asia, and they're kind of separate as a group compared to the ones that we've been studying, but we know that the Neanderthals interact with a lot of the groups that uh, we've been talking about. They have evidence of spirituality and ritual bur burial. Burial. There we go. That's the word. Uh, you can see in this picture, as kind of described in our book, that uh, we found some Neanderthals who actually were laid to rest with uh, wreaths around them, food around them. We don't always know why they did these sorts of things. We wonder if it maybe was a way to honor these people and say, wow, you were a good hunter, so let's leave a little bit of animal skin, kind of one of your prized possessions with you, because now we're leaving you here. Or was it something that maybe they were preparing for the next life? You think about Egyptians, they believe that like your life, you, you just went to another world, and so you needed to take everything with you that was in another world. And we understand that there was this evidence of some start of religion or ritualness to it. If you think about how you could tell that someone's alive, most of us would think about putting in, you know, like a movie, you'd put your hand right up to like their throat where you'd feel their carotid artery and you could feel it beating and you'd know, okay, that person's heart is beating, they're alive. 
But for many people during this time, and many of these uh, groups that were studying, they didn't really understand how life and death worked the same way we do, but they understood that when you stopped breathing and stopped having that, <sighs> you were probably dead. And so that was a good time to probably put you in the ground, especially because you smelled after a while. Uh, we know the Neanderthal peoples inhabited the same areas as Homo sapiens. There was some interaction between them. They were smaller brained than the Homo sapiens, and that eventually will lead to some of their uh, decline and extinction. Creativity of Homo sapiens. These Homo sapiens constructed flexible languages for communication of complex ideas. This is the change from the the <clears throat> to the you know all the sounds with your vocal cords and your tongue. They also had an increased variety of tools. Some used stone blades. Spear throwers, like the ones I talked about before, sewing needles where you're sewing together furs and other goods, and barbed harpoons. Barbed harpoons are great because you can uh, basically harvest fish. If anybody's ever been fishing, the hook is not just a straight hook. It actually has a little bit of like a tang to it or like a 45 degree angle at the end of the hook. That's so that it gets stuck once it goes into the animal. These barbed harpoons are for if you're standing by the shore or a river and you see a fish and you throw a spear, the spear oftentimes would stab the fish, and the fish would just keep on going down the river dead. But if you have a barbed harpoon, you can stab the fish, pull it back out, and it drags the fish with it and keeps it stuck so it can't just run away or swim away. They were able to fabricate uh, ornamental beads, necklaces, and bracelets. This is symbols of power or of wealth, at least at the time, meaning that they had some time to sit around and think, what looks pretty? What's the things that we want to put on our bodies that separates us from other peoples and the bow and arrow this is a dramatic improvement in humans power over nature the bow and arrow allows you uh, to basically fire a projectile very far distances to kill something uh, if you think about it before you'd have to literally get really close to chuck a spear you guys could probably chuck a spear I don't know the half the length of a couple yards I don't know but if you think about having a bow and arrow, it, with practice, you could fire it maybe hundreds of yards, maybe even farther. Uh, the Venus figurines, we start to see pop up every now and then, and I'll talk about those in a minute, and cave paintings. Here's a French cave painting. I'm not going to say the name again, but you can see that these are very complex uh, paintings of animals. These are dating from 15,000 BCE to 9,000 BCE. They used everything from blood to animal fat to saliva to urine, and these colored their walls, and this was able to uh, do a couple things. We think they probably were used for decorations at the time, that if you're living in a cave and you look at the wall, wouldn't you rather look at that nice pretty bowl instead of a big old rock? Or it was to use for telling stories about a great hunt or a story of mythological importance such as the gods and goddesses that they were relaying to one another. We're not 100% sure, but we can see that, wow, they were spending a lot of time not necessarily looking for food, but having some sort of creativity and a creative outlet for uh, what they were thinking and feeling. Then we get to the Neolithic era or the New Stone Age. There's a big distinction in tool production that happens here. It's chipped versus polished. Now, the reason this is special is just because there's a difference between throw away versus cultivate. If you have chipped tools, you are not taking care of the tools that you have. You're using them until they break and then you maybe get another one. Polished tools, on the other hand, are tools that you are taking a lot of care of and you're cultivating something such as like goods, like agriculture. And this cultivation is the giant shift away from hunter-gathering to actually trying to keep and control animals for longer term production. Men, for example, herded animals rather than hunting. Think about sheep. You collect enough sheep, you put up a pen, you will always have, if you have 10 sheep, barring that they get sick or whatever, you're going to have 10 sheep. And you can always shave the sheep and get some of their wool and make clothes, or you can kill the sheep and eat their sweet meat, because lamb is pretty good and so is sheep. And if you're a woman during this time, you are nurturing vegetation. You are farming rather than foraging. Why go wander miles and miles and miles looking for a handful of berries when you could plant some berries with seeds, which they started to figure out would produce plants, and when you're able to nurture that vegetation, a couple months, maybe half a year or so, you're going to have some plants that you can eat. This is way more reliable and predictable than wandering around looking for stuff that might not be there. This starts the spread of agriculture. They developed this really cool idea called slash and burn, 
Basically, they go into an area, they cut, they tear out everything really small. Then they take strips of bark and they burn away all the low-lying grass. Now, this newly burned area is full of nutrients. It's been cleared away of all the old stuff. And when you cultivate that soil a little bit, you're going to have a really rich soil full of nutrients that have been burnt into the soil. This exhaustion of that soil, though, promotes migration. Eventually, that soil will stop having the nutrients to grow your berries or your whatever, and you're needing to move on again. But slash and burn produced a very large amount of nutrients for those crops so they could grow very well for maybe a couple years. There's transport of crops from one region of another. If you're able to grow rice because you were able to find rice in a certain area, but then you do your slash and burn technique for a couple years, and then you have to move on because the soil is dead, you're now taking that rice that you found and moving it to a whole new area. Through this, hundreds of different types of plants and different types of seeds went throughout the entire world, mostly within one hemisphere, like the Western Hemisphere or the Eastern Hemisphere. But what's really nice about that is this was able to promulgate and spread, and people were able to have more diversity in their calorie intake. And with more diversity of food means more diversity of nutrients, minerals, and all the good things that help people not to be dead. Here's a picture of probably what it looked like during the Neolithic era. Uh, you see over here on the left, there's some people like chopping up some wheat or something. You see uh, this woman, she's grinding up some things, I don't know, making tortillas or something. And in the middle, you see the man with his trusty dog, and he has a hoe on his back instead of a big spear, meaning he's going to go out and like cultivate, or he's probably going to herd some animals and stuff. Here's the origins and early spread of agriculture. You can see down here how, like for example, food crops like sorghum and... Sudanic Africa spread around, West Africa, okra moved around, and you can see how they just spread all throughout the regions, making people have um, higher calorie intakes. Now here's one of my favorite things, charts. In AP World, we're going to look at some charts sometimes. Here's agriculture and population growth. 3000 BCE, there's about, I don't know, give or take, what is that, 10 million people Yeah, in the whole entire world. But over time, we get to about 2000 BCE, we have 25 million plus or minus, then 50 million, and eventually there's a huge boom at about 500 BCE with the development of agriculture, which leads to a huge jump in population growth. Because the first three are kind of just small incremental, obviously, but then the last one is a huge jump. This leads us to one of the big truths of world history. As calories slash nutrition increases, the population generally increases. This is, you know, one of the things that we can kind of rely on, barring other factors. This is something really to stick with. And at the bottom, I put vice versa. As calories or nutrition decreases, the population decreases. If you can't find food for all your people, they're going to starve and die. This early agricultural society starts to develop uh, towns and villages. These are smaller uh, groups of people that have band together. We have the discovery of this place called Katahuyuk, a prominent village in Turkey. It was occupied from 7250 BCE to 5400 BCE. In there we found tons of stuff like pots and baskets and textiles and leather and stone and metal tools and wood carvings and carpets and beads and jewelry all these really complex things that you couldn't develop if you're just wandering around looking for stuff. For example, pots. You gotta have some way to dig up clay, form it, cure it with fire in a large furnace, and then you can use it. Uh, leather, for example, is cured animal skins. You have to have a very complex chemical change happen in leather for it to become more hard and fast than, say, just traditional animal skins. You're using uh, wood carvings, which takes a lot of time. If you're carving wood all day, you're not going to be hunting and gathering. So there's, there's a surplus of people, and there's also a surplus of food, because not everyone has to be a farmer, and not everybody has to be uh, shepherding sheep, for example. Now, with the development of crafts, here's like a kind of side note that's interesting. With pottery, it's a storage of food. If you think about a big clay jar, like imagine like a Home Depot bucket, right? That's a simple way to just kind of describe this. Take a Home Depot bucket. Go home, fill it with some water. Fill it to the top. If you are hunting and gathering for over 9.3 miles, as I talked about before, you're not going to want to carry that giant amount of water with you all the time. You might want a little bit of water 
carry on your side, but you're not going to carry that much water. With pottery, you have to add more weight than just the water, right? Well, if you're hunting and gathering, not a good plan to carry with you, but with storage of food and water, such as through agriculture and those sorts of things, and you're settled in one place, pottery is a really good idea. You can put rice in it, and you can store it, and it will be good, and then when you want more rice, you go to the pot, and you get the rice, and you're happy. Uh, it also provides an outlet for artistic expression. Think about like a pot maybe you've seen on TV or in a cartoon or something. Those pots aren't just brown pots most of the time. They have like designs on them or paint and different things like that. This is an artistic expression because you have to do different types of glazes to make it cured. And through that glazing, you're going to have really cool like designs. And then you're also going to tell whose pot is which pot, you know, because obviously people are making different pots. Metallurgy or the making of metal. You have to have furnaces. If you're wandering around again looking for food, you can't build giant pyres of fire and stick metal into it. In the past, they found copper, and copper is really easy when it's cold or just room temperature. You can just hit it with rocks and stuff, and it'll kind of bend and fold. But through the use of furnaces, you can actually take iron or excuse me, copper ore and like burn it and get the pure iron, copper and melt it into different shapes and sharpen it. And these stronger metals are formed in these settled workplaces that people had to build furnaces. Textile production is another development of crafts. It's stronger than natural fibers. And uh, these fur and plant fibers that they were uh, using before would oftentimes fall apart over time. But through textile production, they were able to selectively breed animals and plants. And then they were able to even give women the job of uh, basically spinning or creating these textiles into clothing. And this was a great job for women because now they're at home taking care of children or farming. And they have a lot of downtime in between waiting for stuff to grow. There are some social distinctions that develop, and this is the start of private ownership. When you're not moving, you can now start to have land as a source of wealth. This is my plot of land. This is not your plot of land. You need to go over to your plot of land. Through the accumulation of landed wealth, uh, this initiates the development of social classes. The guy with the most land should be in charge, or vice versa. The guy who's in charge should have the most land, and this kind of distinguished that the guy with the most land is in charge. Individuals could trade surplus food for valuable items. Now, land is important because you have a lot of land to grow food. And again, we're keeping that calorie content and not dying at the cornerstone of our understanding of history. And when individuals have, say, hundreds of acres of land compared to a acre of land, you can take all that extra food that you're growing on there and trade it away for valuable items that make your life maybe happier. Archaeological evidence and a variety of household decorations. We start to see, especially in Chateau Huyuk, that... There are rich homes and there are poor homes. There are people with really ornate designs in their home and extra stuff. And then there's some people that don't have a ton of stuff. And we see that through the goods buried with those deceased members at Chateau Huyuk. Now we get to the Neolithic culture. Farmers are going to start to closely observe the natural world. This is an early kind of applied science. They're looking at the seasons and the stars. They're able to figure out that, hey, sometimes the sun rises like over that tree right there, and then a couple days later it rises a little bit to the right of the tree. And when you're able to figure out how the stars move and the seasons move and what kind of things are going on in the environment because you're in one place, you're able to make predictions a little more readily in certain areas. Uh, elements of natural environment is essential for functioning. Uh, basically they start to develop the first simple calendars. If you plant at the wrong time in the wrong areas, you're not going to get a lot of food. But if you're able to develop a simple calendar knowing, oh, I don't know, 365 days from now, it's going to be the same time we should probably plant around that time, then we're going to get a good crop. Archaeological evidence of religious worship. We found thousands of clay figurines, and we found drawings on pots and tool decorations and other ritual objects. People are starting to observe not only the world around them, and because they're not focused so much on not dying, they're starting to able to look at other things like what happens to you after you die, or those other ritual things like why is it sometimes water falls from the sky and sometimes water doesn't fall from the sky. So they start to figure out maybe there's an association between some bigger powers or higher beings, and they start to build these things called Venus figurines, and they're really closely associated with fertility. Here's the Venus of Willendorf. The first thing you notice is she is fat. And when you think about why they would create these little figurines, she is 
basically a little totem, a small little token that people would either pray to or hold or keep near them as a way to promote fertility. These early ancestors of ours believed that by keeping a Venus figurine, you could have the goddess of love and fertility give you favor because you're giving it offerings or you're giving it a sacrifice through like prayers and that they would give you many children and children kind of were not only just a way of increasing your labor force because if you have a bunch of kids you can make them work on your farm but also a way to kind of continue living on in the epic of gilgamesh he talks about how he wants to specifically gilgamesh the hero of the story wants to cheat death and he travels all over the world and he tries to find ways to not die but at the culmination of the whole story he goes back to his hometown and he looks at the walls and he says there's no way of cheating death except for leaving something behind and people start to realize that children give them happiness and that children are something they can like leave behind it's their like legacy and so by having lots of children they're they're kind of rep well represented this is the son or the daughter of that guy who died and so he like lives on through his children and his children's children those sorts of things this begins the origins of urban life urban life as in cities we get craft specialization people start having jobs now when i say jobs before everybody was like a farmer well if we have too many farmers we're gonna have way too much food so why don't we have some people do some other stuff and we would pick whoever was like for example the best pot maker like making pottery uh he would have a job of just making the pottery and he would trade his pottery for food for his family or himself and then we get professionals like people whose job maybe isn't to make something but to provide some sort of other uh outside good uh, we get social stratification like class there's got to be a leader who should we listen to if I'm mad at you and you're mad at me and we're gonna get in a fight and kill each other isn't it better to find somebody who could like settle our disputes so we have to have some people above us that's governance or rulers and we're gonna have to have uh, cultural workers like if we have this religion like all these little figurines running around and who do we talk to if the gods are mad we got to find some priests or we have to have social workers like guys just to collect taxes so we can fix our walls or maybe we need to fix the well or whatever you know obviously we have to have a bunch of people doing a bunch of different jobs think about a city think about like modern day not all of us have a little farm in our backyard that keep us alive we maybe have jobs like i don't know engineering and engineers might not actually make something they probably just plan something but they still have to find a way to get money and get food because they're valuable to our society as a whole this development it leads to the city this is a gradual process maybe you start with like a ruler and then you get to a couple other jobs and eventually you have thousands of people uh, we know there were large cities upwards of hundreds of thousands of people which would have been huge during this time because most people were just wandering around uh, looking for food and trying not to die and by creating a city you're getting a couple different things you're getting protection in a larger group you're also getting uh, a guaranteed amount of food if you can provide a service to the community and you're also to being able to find some sort of uh, like relationship and camaraderie, camaraderie through connecting with others. Now, one of the things I kind of want to make a side note on is the two main developments of the city versus the Neolithic villages is number one, complex social structure. In a village in the Neolithic times, there was like maybe a leader, but that was it. Everybody just kind of listened to the leader and did whatever the leader said. But in a complex social structure, you have bureaucrats, one of my favorite B words in world history. Uh, bureaucrats are people who do just government positions, government jobs. Maybe the guy who collects taxes. Maybe the guy who orders the people to fix the wall. Maybe the guy who engineers the wall. You have all these different people that are kind of overseeing all these different things. And then number two is the claim to dominance of larger religions. If you have a leader and you have a city of like 200,000 people, well, how far does your borders and influence extend politically, economically, socially? Well, if you're, for example, Katahuyuk, you're kind of a city of like 10,000 probably at the time. You're probably promoting your culture from Chatalhuyuk. You're promoting your economics, like using the same coinage or at least the same weights and measures. You're promoting your same uh, religion that you're promoting from Chatalhuyuk. And all the people outside of your walls and inside of your walls recognize that that is a big place. It also led to a spot where, hey, you want to go and trade your rice for something? Well, you go to the Chatalhuyuk with your rice and you go into town into the market and then you find a merchant again a specialized job trade him that rice and he'll give you like rocks or beads or something whatever 
we have finished our first lecture now at the end of every lecture I'm gonna give you guys some kind of overview that I want you to be able to talk about in class and also be able to understand if you understand this you're pretty close to understanding and getting ready for our test If you don't know what the heck these words mean or you don't understand what's happening in this part then you're probably not ready and you probably should go back re-listen to the lecture or read your book a little closer when you have finished studying this chapter you should be able to do the following compare and contrast the hominids Australopithecus and Homo erectus I do a little T chart to figure that one out explain the development and migration of Homo sapiens go look at that map identify economic and social structures of human societies during the Paleolithic era make a little chart economic social features yada yada understand or list the key elements of Paleolithic culture explain the reasons behind the transition of agriculture during the Neolithic uh, Neolithic era why do people start planting stuff instead of like wandering around looking for stuff discuss the impact that the development of agriculture had upon human society how is agriculture a revolution we talked about it in like the very first slide why is agriculture a revolution how did that change the world as we know it and understand the key elements of neolithic culture and the emergence of urban life how did neolithic culture lead to cities basically now here's your writing assignment you're probably going to have one of these at the end of every lecture so pull out a piece of paper make sure you write these prompts down and in five to eight sentences uh, answer these questions using specific examples from the textbook and be prepared to discuss them in class I will ask you about them and we will discuss them number one would you say that early hunting gathering cultures were based more on cooperation or competition justify your response number two what does the appearance of art forms like sculpture and painting tell us about paleolithic cultures number three the development of human societies discussed in this chapter all point to the increasing complexity in people's lives and cultures what strategies or institutions did people have to develop to cope with this complexity and why thank you for listening to our first lecture I am so excited to get started for our course it is time for you to bust out that textbook and reread your chapter I hope that through this lecture it has made more sense some of the little parts that you maybe didn't understand before uh, go ahead and reread I will see you all tomorrow in class bye what we do here is go back 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 back